Well, that this is the 14th in my series of speeches on the line item veto with particular reference to the Roman Republic and the Roman Senate. When I began this series of one hour speeches on May 5, I spoke of Montesquieu, the eminent French philosopher and author who had greatly influenced the founding fathers with his political theory of checks and balances and separation of powers. What influenced Montesquieu in his espousal of this political system? Montesquieu was greatly influenced by the history of the development of the English Constitution and by the history of the people of Rome. So impressed was Montesquieu uh, with the Romans that he in fact uh, developed and published a work of his own on the subject. Almost midway between the Persian letters in 1721 and the spirit of the laws in 1748, Montesquieu published in 1734 his uh, considerations on the causes of the greatness of the Romans and uh, their decline, which is the least well known of the three. I have uh, also stated a number of times that if we are to have a better appreciation and understanding of the Constitution, its uh, separation of powers and checks and balances, and uh, the power over the purse, then we should follow in Montesquieu's tracks and study Roman history as he did. And that is what we have been doing together uh, during these past uh, several months. Now, what have we uh, acquired to uh, pay us for our pains? What, what have we uh, gained that can be uh, applicable to our own time, and our own country, and to the political questions of today concerning the checks and balances and the control over the purse? Well, let us see. Now, Mr. President, uh, I hold that human nature and a molecule of water are the same. Human nature is like a molecule of water. It has never changed. That which was H2O at the beginning of creation when the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters is still H2O today. Two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. And that which was human nature when Adam and Eve fell from grace is still human nature today. It has never changed. And as human nature has not changed from the beginning, but is still motivated by the same emotions and instincts and needs and drives, love and hate and fear and greed and hunger and so on. And the history of man's actions will always have a way of repeating itself. So as we who live today contribute to the flow of history's unceasing stream. It would be worth our while to examine the events of past ages, their causes and their consequences, in order that we might better understand the causes and possible consequences of the phenomena, the happenings, the events, and the actions of our own life and time. Napoleon said, uh, let my son often 
read and reflect upon history, this is the only true philosophy. So, we have elected, uh, as did Montesquieu, to look to Roman history for guidance. Roman power derived from Roman virtue, basically. In other words, the old Roman virtues, the great moral qualities. The average Roman, as we have noted, was simple, steadfast, honest, courageous, law-abiding, patriotic, and reverent. And his leaders were men of uncommon dedication and acumen. From the earliest times, the Romans possessed a profound reverence for national tra tradition, a firm conviction of being the special the special object of and instrument of destiny and a strong sense of individual responsibility and obligation to be true to that tradition and fulfill that destiny. There spring to mind uh, several parallels between the history of the Romans and the history of our own uh, republic. As we see that the same old virtues that lent uh, sturdiness and integrity to the early Romans gave stability and substance and strength and character to our own national life in the early years of its formation and development. The Roman family was the cornerstone of the Roman social structure. And the fa family sa setting instilled its members with self-discipline and with the respect for authority and the veneration of ancestors and the reverence for the gods that uh, lent stability to Roman society and discipline to the Roman legions. The Roman family unit was a religious organization, a community of worship centered around the hearth, the cult of the hearth and the cult of the dead. Each morning and evening, the entire family, including the slaves, offered prayers and sacrifices to the departed ancestors at the family hearth, whose ever-burning flame symbolized both the unity and the continuity of the Roman family. Because of the pastoral tradition of the Romans, the Romans, like the Jews of the Old Testament, sacrificed animals to their gods. Reverence and the idea of obligation inherent in the Roman conception of the relation between gods and men inevitably developed among the Romans a strong sense of duty, a moral factor of inestimable work, worth.
And Mr. President, uh, we have seen that same strong tradition of family and religious values. In our own, in the formation of our own country from colonial times down to the mid 20th century. And the erosion of these values over the past 50 to 60 years has signified a weakening of the moral and spiritual strength of this nation as it did uh, in the Roman state. We have seen uh, in the Roman and American psyches a manifest destiny, an urge to extend the territorial frontier We saw in the territorial expansion of the Roman city-state what amounted to an over-expansion. We saw the drain that was placed upon Roman manpower and the burden that was imposed upon the administration of the far-flung provinces. While in our own case, territorial expansion uh, has long ceased. In recent years, we have spent billions of dollars on space exploration. And we stand in danger of overextending our international commitments and our financial capability to sustain and underwrite them. We've been talking about that a good bit uh, lately. We've also drawn parallels in the vanishing peasantry from the land and the decline in small family farms, the consequences of which have been increasing unemployment and crime and poverty in the cities and a growing welfare dependence upon the state. During the centuries of the early and middle republic, public office in Rome was obtained only through virtue. And it brought with it no pay, no salary, no benefit other than honor. And the opportunity to, to prove oneself worthy of being preferred for further toils on behalf of the state. In the last century of the Republic, the old citizen soldiery and the old moral structure of integrity and uh, dedication to the cause of country gave way to greed and graft and corruption and venality and political demagoguery, much of which we see in our own time and in our own country. And the self-seeking ambitions of Roman generals and politicians led to civil wars and violence and military domination by standing armies made up of professional soldiers. And in our own republic, the military-industrial complex against which President Eisenhower warned 
can pose a threat to the system. And so, Mr. President, there are sundry similarities between our own history and the history of the Romans. Now let us uh, turn to the consideration of the Roman political system. In the Roman Republic, the political organization was complex and it was also experimental. Unlike that of Lycurgus, the Spartan general of the 9th century BC, Lycurgus united in his constitution all of the good and distinctive features of the best governments so that none of the principal parts would uh, unduly grow and predominate. But inasmuch as the force of each part would be neutralized by that of the others, None of them would prevail and outbalance another. Therefore, the Constitution would remain in a state of equilibrium. Lycurgus then, foreseeing by a process of reasoning whence and how events would naturally happen constructed his constitution untaught by adversity. And while the Romans would achieve the same final result, Polybius, according to Polybius, they did not reach it by any process of reasoning but by the discipline of many trials and struggles. And by always choosing the best in the light of ex the experience gained, they reached the same result as Lycurgus. Let us uh, then uh, consider the Roman system as it was seen by Polybius, the Greek historian, who lived in Rome from 168 BC after the Battle of Pydna until after 150 BC at a time when the Roman Republic was at a pinnacle of majesty that excited his admiration and his comment. Polyphius viewed the Roman Constitution as having three elements. The executive, the senate, and the people. With their respective share of power in the state, regulated by a scrupulous regard to equality and equilibrium. So let us examine the separation of powers in the Roman Republic as explained by Polybius.
the consul representing the executive was the supreme master of the administration of the government when remaining in Rome. All of the other magistrates except the tribunes were under the consuls and took their orders from the consuls. The consuls presented matters before the Senate required, that required the deliberation of the Senate and saw to the execution of the Senate's decrees. And in matters requiring the authorization of the people, the consuls summoned the popular meetings and presented the proposals for the decision and carried out the decrees of the majority. And in matters of war, the consuls imposed such levies upon the allies as the consuls deemed appropriate and made out the role for soldiers and selected those who were suitable. Consuls had absolute power to inflict punishment upon all who were under their command and they had all but absolute power in the conduct of military campaigns. As to the Senate, we're talking about the separation of powers. As to the Senate, the Senate had complete control over the Treasury. And the questors, the questors could not issue any public money to the various departments of the state without a decree of the Senate. The Senate controlled the money for the repair and construction of public works and public buildings throughout it Italy. And none of that money could be obtained by the censors who oversaw the contracts for public works and public buildings. None of that money could be obtained by the censors except by the grant of the Senate. The Senate also had jurisdiction over all crimes requiring a public investigation, such as treason, conspiracy, poisoning, or willful murder, as well as controversies between and among allied states, receptions for ambassadors, and matters affecting foreign states were the business of the Senate. Well, what was left in the Constitution for the people? The people participated in the ratification of treaties and alliances and decided questions of war and peace. The people passed and repealed laws. And invested individuals with public office which according to Polybius were the most honorable rewards for virtue. Now, Polybius having described separation of powers under the Roman Constitution, how did the three parts of government check and balance one another. Well, Mr. President, uh, during the past several months, I have been talking about the various checks that the consuls and tribunes, the Senate and the assemblies 
exercise against one another, and I have paid particular attention to the veto power of the Senate and the tribunes. <laughs> Henry Clay, who believed that the veto power of American presidents was despotic and ought to be circumscribed, stated in a Senate floor speech that the veto origina originated in the institution of the tribunician power in ancient Rome and had been introduced from the practice under the empire into the monarchies of Europe. And Polybius explains the checks and balances as he had observed them firsthand. Remember, he was living in Rome. According to Polybius, the consuls, what, what were the checks upon the consuls, the executive? The consuls whose power over the administration of the government when in the city and over the military when in the field appeared absolute, stood in need of the support of the Senate and the people. The consul, the consul needed supplies for his legion, but without a decree of the Senate, his soldiers could be supplied with neither corn nor clothes nor pay. And all of his plans would be futile if the Senate shrank from danger or if the Senate opposed his plans or sought to, to hamper them. Therefore, whether the consul could carry any undertaking to a successful conclusion depended upon the Senate, which had the absolute power at the end of his one year term to replace him with another consul or to extend his command. Even to the successes of the consuls on the field of battle, the Senate had the power to add honor and glory or to obscure their merits because unless the Senate concurred in the recognition of the in the, in the recogni recognition of the achievements of the consuls and voted money there could be no celebration or public triumphs moreover the consuls were obliged to take into account the wishes of the people. So here's the check of the people against the council. For it was the people who would uh, agree to or repudiate the terms of peace. But most of all, the consuls, when laying down their office at the conclusion of their one-year term, would have to give an account of, the, of their administration, both to the Senate and to the people. So it was important that the consuls maintain the goodwill of both the Senate and the people. Now, what were the checks against the Senate? The Senate had to take the multitude into account and respect the wishes of the people. 
for in matters directly affecting the senators, for instance, in case of a law diminishing the traditional authority of the Senate, or depriving senators of certain dignities, or even actually reducing the property of senators. In such cases, the people, the people had the power to pass or reject such a law in their assemblies. And in addition, according to Polybius, if the tribunician, if the tribunes impose their veto, the Senate would be not only be unable to pass a decree, but it could not even hold a meeting. And because the tribunes were required to have a regard for the people's wishes, the Senate stood in awe of the multitude and could not neglect the feelings of the people. But as a counterbalance now, what, what check is there, was there against the people? We saw the checks against the consuls, we saw the checks against the Senate. What about the people? As a counterbalance, the people were not entirely independent of the Senate. But they were bound to observe its wishes also, collectively and individually. individually. In the matter of contracts, for example, contracts were given throughout all of Italy by the censors for the repair and construction of public works and public buildings. Then there was the matter of the collection of revenues from rivers and harbors and mines and land. Everything, in a word, that came under the control of the Roman government. And in all of these things, the people were engaged, either as contractors or as uh, putting up their property as security for the contractors or in selling supplies or making loans to the contractors or as engaging in the work and in the employ of the contractors. Over all these transactions, says Polybius, the Senate had complete control. For example, it could extend the time on a contract and thus assist the contractors. Or in case of unforeseen accident, it could uh, relieve the contractors of a portion of their obligation. Or it could even release them altogether if they were abs absolutely unable to fulfill the contract. So in many ways the Senate could inflict great hardships upon the contractors or on the other hand they could grant great indulgences to the contractors but in every case the appeal came to the Senate and the Senate's ace card of course was its control over the purse strings also the judges were taken from the Senate and chosen from the Senate in the time of Polybius for the majority of trials in which the charges were heavy. And consequently, the people were cautious about resisting or actively opposing the will of the Senate because they were uncertain as to when they might need the Senate's aid. 
And in a similar way, the people were cautious about rashly, ra rashly resisting the will of the consuls because one and all might, uh, in one way or another, become subject to the absolute power of the consuls at some time. Polybius summed it up in this way. When any one of the three classes becomes puffed up and uh, displays a uh, an inclination to be overly encroaching. The mutual interdependency of all the three and the possibility of the pretensions of any one being checked and thwarted by the others must surely check this tendency. And so the proper equilibrium is maintained by the impulsiveness of the one part being checked by its fear of the other. Polybius' account uh, may not have been an exact representation of the true state of the Roman system, but he was on the scene. And he was writing to tell us what he saw with his own eye, and not through the eyes of someone else. So what better witness can we have? The theory of a mixed constitution, that's what ours is, a mixed constitution, checks and balances, separation of power. The theory of a mixed constitution had had its uh, great measure of success in the Roman Republic, and uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that the constitutional framers were familiar with the works of Polybius, or that uh, Montesquieu should have been influenced by the checks and balances and separation of powers in the Roman constitutional system, a clear element of which was the control over the purse vested solely in the Senate in the heyday of the Republic. So, Mr. President, uh, in my presentations today and heretofore, I have uh, called attention to the similarities between the history of the Romans and our own history. And I've drawn many parallels between our own republic and the historical meanderings of that ancient republic that rose and declined along the banks of the Tiber River. A parallel which induced someone in an earlier American generation to name the tiny stream that once flowed across the present-day mall, Tiber Creek. It is my own sincere prayer, however, that the United States will not follow a course parallel to the Roman Republic in its inexorable decline and decadence. Mr. President, uh, worthy scholars and thoughtful authors 
have exhausted rivers of ink in attempting to analyze the decline and fall of the Roman Republic and the subsequent uh, empire. And among the foremost of these author historians is Edward Gibbon. Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire is an incon incontestable historical classic. And no competent grasp of Roman historiography can be achieved without taking Gid Gibbon into consideration. Edward Gibbon. If you haven't read his volumes, read them. Whereas Polybius wrote about the rise of the Roman Republic and its greatness, Gibbon wrote about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which followed on after the Republic. However, Gibbon outlines a case for Rome's decline which, with which few, if any, subsequent historians will agree. Gibbon charges Christianity with the decline and fall of Rome. He cites Christianity as being the major cause of declines, of, of Rome's decline. Now, Gibbon's assertion is not an atheist diatribe against Christianity, as some people might assume. Gibbon's position is that the otherworldly orientation of Christianity its exclusivistic monotheism, its withdrawal from the larger society, its condemnation of Mediterranean culture, its uh, fostering of monasticism, and its contemplative emphasis when taken together, refocused the people's attention on spiritual values to the detriment of the practicality, the civic activism, and the aggressiveness that characterized and gave rise to the Roman attitude toward life. Conversely, While Gibbon was acquainted with and recounted the evidences of Rome's decline, none of which Christianity was responsible for, moral decadence, tyrannical emperors, barbarian incursions, the decline of the small family farms, the vanishing peasantry, depletion of soils and accessible mineral resources, and the collapse of the faith in the old gods. Gibbon treats all of these as being merely coincidental with Rome's decline. Minor distractions and sideshows around the center ring's main event, namely Christianity's gnawing away at the empire superstructure. Certainly no informed student of Roman history can ignore Gibbon's achievement both as a historian and as an interpreter of ancient Roman civilization. But the decline 
and fall of the Roman Empire. An undeniable classic. is not the last word. On ancient Rome. Because during the almost 200 years. Since Gibbon wrote his masterpiece, we have witnessed a revolution in historical methodology and a reformation in our comprehension of the causes of Rome's failure. For example, Will Durant, who's, uh, who had uh, a political and uh, cultural influence on the early part of this century broadly represents a 20th century perspective of the causes of Rome's decline and decay. In the story of civilization, Will Durant asserts that Rome was already in decline when Christianity emerged on the scene. An eroding faith in the Greco-Roman pantheon of deities, a decline in family life, rotting public and individual morality, the corrosion of discipline, patriotism, and the military esprit, the abandonment of the land by the peasant classes, agricultural decline, and deforestation, civil wars, class struggle, international warfare, Praetorian intrigues and conspiracies, assassination, violence, civil disorder, Bureaucratic despotism, economic depression, stifling taxes and corruption in government, mad emperors, pestilences, and plague, games and circuses, free bread and the welfare mob. All of these, all of these, ate away the moral and spiritual and social underpinning, underpinnings of the Roman state. And accelerated its plunge into hopeless impotence and eventual obscurity as a military power and territorial empire. And against such a backdrop of crises and fecklessness and drift, Christianity served not as a cause of decay and collapse, but as a lifeboat for a despairing populace. Rome was already a cracked shell when Christianity ascended the stage. And so the fate of Rome was sealed by the one-by-one one donations of power and prerogative which the Senate plucked from its own quiver and voluntarily delivered into the hands first of Julius Caesar and Octavian and then 
into the trust of the succession of Caligulas and Neros and Commoduses and Elagabaluses and all who followed. Until at last, the ancient and noble ideals of the Roman Republic had been dissolved in the stinking brew of imperial debauchery and tyranny and megalomania and rubble into which the Roman Empire eventually sank. At the height of the Republic, the Roman Senate was the only agency that possessed the authority, the perspective, and the popular aura to debate and investigate and commission and correct the problems that confronted the Roman state and its citizens. But the Senate's loss of will and its eagerness, its eagerness to hand over its responsibility to a one-man government, a man on a white horse, a dictator, and later an emperor, doomed Rome and predestined Rome's decline and ultimate fall. Now, Mr. President, uh, those uh, political midwives who were attendant at the birth of our own republic George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, James Wilson, uh, Elbridge Gerry, and others were among the wisest men of their time in this or any other country. Many of them had served in the Continental and Confederation Congresses and in state legislatures. And all of them were exceptional and reflective men. Many of those constitutional framers were well acquainted with Cicero and Polybius and Livius and Tacitus and Plutarch and with the glories of the ancient Roman Republic. And those brilliant men borrowed from the best of ancient Rome. And they purposefully and deliberately named the upper chamber of the Congress the Senate. And just as carefully they set in place a system of checks and balances and separation of powers enlarge the control of the purse in the people's branch to prevent the rise of a new coinage of imperial executives in the federation that they created. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that I may speak uh, beyond the hour for no more than five minutes. The senator has five, six minutes remaining in, in his original term. I thank the chair. I ask that the uh, state show no interruption. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, in our own times, we see The same problems, the same kinds of dilemmas that the hand of history wrote large upon Rome's slate being written upon America's slate. In uh, difficult times and in times of crises, many people grow impatient as they grew impatient during the French Revolution and elevated Napoleon to the emperorship as they grew impatient during the Russian Revolution and elevated Lenin to the head of state. 
As they grew impatient to a during Depression era Germany and elevated Adolf Hitler to the presidency and the chancellorship. As they grew impatient in Cuba and elevated Fidel Castro to the dictatorship. We seem in these times to have reached a stage where we remain in the state of crisis or semi-crisis or pseudo-crisis. The American people have grown impatient and they're demanding solutions to the serious problem. Solutions that do not lend themselves to easy thinking. And problems that do not lend themselves to easy and quick solutions. The solutions to these problems will be painful and will take time, perhaps years, to succeed. This is not a truth that many people want to hear. Many people would rather believe that uh, quack remedies such as the line item veto and uh, enhanced rescission's power in the hands of presidents will somehow miraculously solve the fiscal situation and eliminate the monstrous deficits that confront the nation. Mm. All too many people would perhaps prefer to abolish the Congress and institute one-man government from now on. Some people have no patience with constitutions for that matter. But Mr. President, let us, let us study Rome. Mr. President, I'll go about another five minutes. I don't want to be interrupted. I ask unanimous consent that I may have that time. Let us study Rome. The important lesson that we can get from Rome for our purposes here is that when the Roman Senate gave away the power over the purse, the Roman Senate gave away its power to check the executive. And from that time on, the Senate declined. And as we have noted, it was only a matter of time. And when the foundation weakened, the structure collapsed, and the Roman Republic fell. This lesson is as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. Does anyone, Mr. President, does anyone really imagine that the splendors of this capital city stand or fall with mansions and monuments and buildings and piles of masonry? These are but brick and mortar, bricks and mortar lifeless thing. And whether they collapse or are rehabilitated means little or nothing when measured on the great clock tower of time. But the survival of the American constitutional system the foundation upon which the superstructure of the Republic rests 
finds its firmest support in the continued preservation of the delicate mechanism of checks and balances, separation of power, and the control of the purse, which was sol solemnly instituted by the Founding Fathers. And for over 200 years, from the beginning of the Republic to this very hour, it has survived an unbroken continuity. We received it from our fathers. Let us assuredly pass it on to our sons and our daughters. Mr. President, uh, I close my reflections on the ancient Roman Republic with the words of George Washington from his speech on the centennial anniversary of George Washington's, the speech of Daniel Webster, from his speech on the uh, centennial anniversary of George Washington in 1832. Other misfortunes may be born or their effects overcome. If disastrous war should sweep our commerce from the ocean, another generation may renew it. If it exhausts our treasury, future industry may replenish it. If it desolate and lay waste our fields, still under new cultivation, they will grow green again and ripen to future harvests. Yea, it were but a trifle if the walls of yonder capital were to crumble. If the lofty pillars should fall and their gorgeous decorations be all covered by the dust of the valley, all these may be rebuilt. But who shall reconstruct the fabric of demolished government. Who shall rear again the well-proportioned columns of constitutional liberty? Who shall frame together the skillful architecture that unites national so sovereignty with state rights, with individual security and with public prosperity? No, if these columns ever fall, they will be raised not again. Like the Colosseum and the Parthenon, they will be destined to a mournful, a melancholy immortality. Bitterer tears will flow over them, however, than were ever shed over the monuments of Roman or Grecian art. For they will be the remnants of a more glorious edifice than Greece or Rome ever saw, the edifice of constitutional American liberty. Mr. President, I again thank uh, my good friends, uh, Senator Stevens, Senator Inouye, and Senator Nichols for their patience and their indulgence. I thank the chair and I thank all senators. I thank the two leaders for their accommodations and their courtesies and the floor staff, uh, Lula and Marty and all the others, who have been so helpful and so accommodating and so thoughtful uh, during these more than five months as I have carried forth this series of one-hour speeches on the line item veto. I yield the floor.